healing is possible. We share stories of people everywhere who have healed from their diagnoses. Powered by healthrevolution.org. I'm your host, Dr. Anup Kumar. Welcome to the Healing is Possible podcast. My guest today is Professor Lehman McHenry. Before we start the conversation, a program note that we've just launched our Health Jumpstart program through which we're helping people to discover their own power to heal and get better through nutrition, movement, connection, and rest, what we call our four engines. So you can check that out at healthrevolution.org slash jumpstart. Professor McHenry is a bioethicist and emeritus professor of philosophy at California State University, Northridge. His research interests center on medical ethics, metaphysics, and philosophy of science. He is the co-author of the book, The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine, which I have right here. I read it maybe about a year ago. And Professor McHenry, I want to stop, I want to start rather by sharing a tweet that I sent out in November of 2021 um, when I was 12 pages into your book. Um, so this is what I wrote, quote, a very, so I took a snapshot of the pic and I put it on Twitter and I wrote, quote, a very painful read and I'm only 12 pages in. All physicians know evidence is important, and all physicians know that the phrase evidence-based medicine has also become a brand. We too rarely ask what evidence has been left out, what has not been studied, what has been tweaked, end quote. And I believe, Lehman, that this is the most popular quote uh, tweet that I've ever sent out. It got 171 retweets <laughs> and 677 likes, which is a lot for me, but I think speaks a lot to the polarizing topic of evidence-based medicine or EBM, especially in these times with the pandemic and so many, so many controversies happening. So I think it's a difficult conversation to have because it seems to be either people say evidence-based medicine, it's science, don't ask any questions, that is it, or it's, it's all a conspiracy, right? There's nothing scientific and we shouldn't listen to any of that stuff. And I think most people who would reasonably think without even knowing the data would say, well, the truth is probably somewhere in between. So that's kind of the frame for this conversation. And if I may just start by asking the obvious question, what is the illusion of evidence-based medicine? Well, Dr. Kumar, first of all, I wanna thank you very much for inviting me to be on your show. Um, the, I should clarify, uh, especially with regard to your tweet about the, the pain that I've caused you for only 12 pages into the book. Um, I'm certainly not an opponent of evidence-based medicine. That is to say, my co-author and I, Dr. Giardini, and I uh, are advocates of evidence-based medicine. We think that it is one of the most important um, um, pieces of progress in, in the scientific foundation of medicine. And we're doing everything we can to expose what's problematic about evidence-based medicine to set it back on the proper track. So um, some, some of our critics have alleged that, that, uh, uh, that, that somehow or other, we, we are opponents of evidence-based medicine. So, so if the title suggests that, that's entirely wrong. Um, the illusion of evidence-based medicine is um, basically based upon the concept that the um, most reliable evidence in the hierarchy of evidence-based medicine is the randomized clinical trials. And since most of those clinical trials are conducted by the pharmaceutical industry testing their own products, it creates an enormous problem of credibility uh, in terms of how we're meant to understand um, the, the top of the hierarchy of evidence-based medicine when, it, when in fact um, it's clear that those trials are unreliable, that, that there is more than enough evidence to suggest that, that these trials are, are corrupted um, by the financial incentive of, of those who conduct those trials. So what we do in our book is focus on 
in detail on two clinical trials that we know were corrupted and still remain amongst the evidence base in the clinical practice guidelines. Mm. So that's very telling. So a couple of questions come up for me. So first of all, you've clarified that what you're saying is that you are for evidence-based medicine. However, the hierarchy of what we consider to be good evidence, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a further clarification. There's evidence, and then we need to look at evidence and say, what is good evidence and what is not so good evidence? And in fact, we're taught that in medical school. There is, as you say, an hierarchy that we are taught, randomized controlled trials, double blind are at the top, and what we call anecdotal. Anecdotal is almost a bad word. Like mm -hmm. you almost say it in a hushed voice in medicine. Well, that's an anecdote, right? It's meaning, yeah. meaning that it's a story that we have heard, uh, whether it's, and we don't know if it's reproducible, we can't testify to the veracity of it and so on. But some of those very same issues are there for what we call the gold standard. So it's the hierarchy right. that you're taking issue with. Yes, um, and, and I actually even know physicians who, after they have been enlightened about this problem of, of the industry-sponsored uh, clinical trials that largely form the basis, the evidence base, uh, that, that, that uh, the hierarchy of evidence-based medicine gets turned upside down that the least reliable evidence becomes the industry conducted clinical trials. And now it looks like the most reliable evidence you have is your own prescribing experience. Yeah. Uh, I... But let me just say one other thing. Yeah. I've just recently come across a revision of an evidence-based medicine hierarchy where the, um, the top of the hierarchy is critically appraised randomized control trials. So randomized control trials by itself uh, is not sufficient. These have to be independently evaluated by another body. In other words, they've been critically appraised and only those make it to the hot, top, top of the hierarchy. Now, uh, who is actually in a position to do anything like that? Well, yeah. Dr. Giardini and I spent 12 years doing two of those clinical trials, yeah. just to give you some idea of the amount of labor and time it takes to undertake that kind of, um, uh, of a critical process. And, and by and large, uh, it was extremely difficult to, for us to get our work published in the medical journals. Uh, that's another topic, right, about censorship and retraction. And when we did get it published, it was certainly not in the most um, high, highly respected, uh, high impact journals. Uh, so, so, so that's that's a problem too. A, a problem about how the uh, evidence is communicated, and who owns the means of communication here? All of all of these uh, different entities are operating together to maintain the status quo, which is a corrupted system. Wow, you touched on four topics that could be books unto themselves in that two <laughs> minutes. Um, you talked about flipping the hierarchy, and it could be the case that a physician's experience with their patients over years can be the most reliable from a scientific perspective, could be the most reliable, even more than randomized controlled trials, because if they're an honest physician, they can trust at least what they've seen. And it's also local for that particular population, that environment, yep. you know, everything then and, and over time, as opposed to randomized controlled trial, which is technically much more, many more data points, but number one, are they relevant to this particular practice? But number two, are the data reliable? Yeah. Ha has, has that clinical trial been designed properly? Has it been conducted properly? And has it been reported properly? And uh, I'm here to say today that um, I've seen lots of evidence in 20 years of, uh, of investigating um, corruption in medicine, that, that um, um, this is the norm. Do you have a, an estimate? Well, two questions. Number one, is this predominantly in the United States or North America? And number two, 
within the United States, let's say, because that's where you live, um, do we know what percent of studies are we talking about? And is it certain drugs? Is it all drugs? Is it medical devices? Well, um, I, as I have disclosed in the book, uh, Dr. Giardini and I work for a law firm in California called the um, Baum Hedlund Aristi and Goldman law firm that conducts a lot of litigation against the pharmaceutical industry. And so when these um, corrupted clinical trials uh, for pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and medical devices come to our attention, we're certainly seeing the worst cases. If it comes to our attention, we're certainly seeing the worst cases. So, so you, you might say, well, okay, so isn't, isn't your research biased in the sense that uh, you're seeing the very worst of medicine? Well, um, there's, there's a lot of evidence here in the uh, bioethics and research journals to suggest that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that um, you know, it's only when we see grave harm done to patients that it reaches the level of litigation. But, but um, there, there's, there's a lot of evidence to su suggest here that we can extrapolate from these cases to show that this is, this is a, an epidemic affecting the way in which medical research is conducted. So my view is, is that while I can't prove it, in each and every case, I'm highly skeptical of anything that has been produced by the industry. I mean, if you think about it, it's absurd right from the very start. How is it that a manufacturer um, is, is to be trusted for testing its own product? That's where I think the, the, the basis of the problem is. Well, yeah, I um, think it's like, you know, I, I'm thinking of automobiles and, and safety belts or uh, safety test crashes, and that has to go through the National Highway Safety Administration. and now, I believe it's the NHSA who does the crash tests um, and not the automobile manufacturers themselves. I'm not sure about that. Um, in the case of drugs, yes, I see what you're saying, that, that the, the industry produces it, the industry tests it. Now, there is the FDA that's supposed to function as a, as a gatekeeper. Uh, what has your research shown about the FDA and how it functions? Well, the, the, the FDA is a, is a whole chapter of my book about, about governance and regulation. And, and what we find is that the, the FDA tends to treat the pharmaceutical industry as a client rather than as an entity that needs to be regulated. And so the client is paying a user fee. And, and in, in many cases, they, they get accelerated uh, approval of their products based upon uh, some pretty flimsy evidence. So what what I found is that the the uh, the industry when they submit an application for a new drug application or medical device, they only have to produce a minimum of two successful clinical trials. And what's not being sort of taken account of here is all of the negative evidence, that is to say all of the clinical trials where it's shown uh, that the drug has not outperformed placebo, for example. Uh, and so what the FDA is actually getting is the final clinical reports and some summaries of the data that are produced by the pharmaceutical industry. And what we've actually found in some cases is that those clinical reports that have been submitted to the FDA uh, are fraudulent. So just as the medical journal articles have been guilty of fraudulently um, reporting the results of clinical trials, so are the final, final clinical studies reports. Um, now, the, the other problem with the, with the FDA is that there's a, there's a phenomenon known as the revolving door, mm -hmm. where the people who work as regulators move back and forth between the drug industry and the regulatory agency uh, such that the very same individuals who are the ones that approve the drugs go back then and work for the pharmaceutical industry as consultants and are, and are paid 
to advise the industry on the best means of getting accelerated acceptance of their products. So, so the, the system is broken. Yeah. When you say the pharmaceutical industry is treated as a client of the FDA, you know, in a, in a client relationship, obviously the client is paying somebody. What is the equivalent of that in this relationship? Because I don't think they're paying, the, well, maybe they are paying the government, but what does that look like? Well, what it looks like is that they pay a user fee. They pay a fee to uh, have their, their drugs um, uh, considered for a license. And uh, that changed the whole sort of uh, relationship between the entity to be regulated and the regulator. And that was there was a lot of um, uh, industry friendly legislation in the 1990s that created this state of affairs. Does that, uh, and, sorry to interrupt that. Does that just to understand this a little better, if the FDA gets paid, it's, I can understand a private company, they're getting paid, their profits are going up. The FDA is, is a government body. I assume the salaries of the FDA employees are not going up based on those payments. I don't know. What, what, is, what exactly is the incentive? But I, I, but I think that a great deal of the money that's received from those, um, those fees are going to pay those salaries okay. of those people in the FDA. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing that you find is that very often you'll find a whistleblower in the FDA who will come forward and say, um, you know, I I was very skeptical about the, the the data that was being submitted to me for the license for this drug, and when I raised the question, uh, it, it was pretty clear that my my supervisors wanted this drug approved, and and uh, they didn't want to hear any any questions about the uh, reliability of the data. Hmm. It sounds to me like you're saying that the FDA is getting cliff notes, you know, or like they're getting summary reports. Um, whereas what we're told in medical school and, and anybody who is looking at research is to look at the details, look at the data, look at how the data is being interpreted. And of course you look at funding too, that, that also we're taught. It's not, as yeah. physicians, we're not blind to this. We know that funding matters, um, but it's not, we don't talk so much about the fact that these studies that are going to the FDA and to journals like the New England Journal and, and the Lancet, some of the top journals, they're kind of summaries in the sense that some of the data is reported, some of the studies are reported. And it's, it's one of those cases where if I say I have 100 units of something, um, but I don't know what the denominator is, the denominator is 10 billion. So 100 sounds like a lot, but actually it's, it's insignificant. Now, if that denominator of the number of studies or the pieces of data is 110, and I have 100 of them, now 100 is hugely significant. So it's like the denominator is the seems to me the X factor, the variable of what data is included, what is not included. Is there any way to know what that number is? Because it sounds to me yeah. like you're saying industry owns the data. Exactly, and this is a great problem here that that um, that the industry owns the data, the data because they are the ones who are paid for the clinical trials. Uh, and they release the data uh, as they as they wish. There's the heart of the problem there. Um, now, it, when you talk about the data, there are various levels of data here. Uh, and and at the very bottom, or you might call it, call it the raw data. Mm -hmm. So what's the raw data? Well, the raw data is what's filled out on those uh, case report forms for each patient in the clinical trial. Now, if you think about uh, just one clinical trial that has, oh, say, 20 or 50 different sites in two or three different countries, uh, and all of the data that would be generated from all of those sites, who is it that actually has the time to go back and look at that raw data? Well, this is what we did. Nobody does that. And I don't think the FDA does anything like this at all. Mm. The, the FDA doesn't have access to that raw data unless they demand it. And it doesn't look to me like they are demanding it. They don't, they simply don't have the time to do that. Uh, so you've got, you've got people like myself and Dr. Giardini who are consultants for a law firm and, uh, and we're trying to get to the bottom of things. And because we don't trust the 
the the medical journal article that's been reported uh high impact medical journals uh we don't trust the final clinical studies report and so when we go to the raw data to see just exactly how that's been compiled by the statisticians to produce all these tables and charts that's where the devil's in the details and that's where we find uh just exactly how badly the the data has been uh, misreported and i could give you some examples if you like but that's speaking in general terms yes um well i want to get to that i want to make sure we cover a lot of the big points so um I will ask for that in just a minute. What surprised me, I learned this from your book, is that the studies are not just conducted within one company, but there is an entire array of organizations, it seems like. So one company contracts with another company and the second company specializes only in conducting trials, for example. And of course, that company is the client. And so they are incentivized to to produce results that are favorable, obviously. And so, you know, it's almost like, you know, I think of Henry Ford and the assembly line for to, to build a car, you become more and more and more efficient at producing the desired results. Mm -hmm. And here in the end of it, the desired result isn't really good evidence. It's evidence that favors a sale, right? And, and that was news Correct. to me. I, I, while I knew there was corruption, but the actual mechanics of it Mm -hmm. that there are companies just dedicated to this beyond just a pharmaceutical company, for example, that was news to me. Yeah. So you've got the pharmaceutical company, which is um, um, hiring all of these other companies, you know, to, to, to base basically uh, give them the end result, what they want, which is their drug looks as favorable as possible and is presented in medical journals and in medical conferences and clinical guidelines, prescribing guidelines, uh, television advertisements, so on and so forth. You know, so what are the, all those different entities that are conspiring together to produce this end result? Uh, which which is marketing. It's a marketing triumph over science. That's that's the basic problem here. There are medical communications companies which function more or less as public relation agencies specializing in medicine. They're the ones who are doing a lot of the promotion. They're the ones who are ghostwriting the manuscripts that appear in the medical journals. They're the ones who are producing the slides for the doctors to go out and, and give lunch, lunch and dinner talks on, on the drugs. Uh, they're the ones who are recruiting the key opinion leaders to come on board. You know, you, then you've got the CROs, the contract research organizations that are hired to do the, um, the conduct the clinical trials. Then you've got the um, uh, continuing medic medical education companies that produce content for doctors to give continuing medical education based upon what based upon all based upon the same fraudulent data um, and these are just a few of the entities you know that are part of this this very very large network did you come across um, so you, you you were working on this for 12 years um, I finished my I finished medical school and started training in emergency medicine in 2007. So, you know, for us, there was this kind of culture where a lot of people said, hey, we recognize this corruption is happening and now we have to cut down or we're cutting down, you know, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical reps can't come into, you know, your office anymore or the ER and start, start selling something, no free lunches, can't get, you know, paid vacations and, and things like that. So, are you speaking post all of these changes, pre all of these changes, or did you encounter that in your research? No, well, this is exactly what was going on about the time that I came on board, which okay. was about you know 2005, 2006, 2007, where we were starting to see some practical changes, and you know, and I thought that that was that was very good. When I go to my doctor at Kaiser Permanente, you don't see anywhere. Uh, any logos for or drug advertisements, uh, that, and that was a that was a big step forward. Basically, saying uh, we can't be bought. Uh, now, um, that's a practical change. That's that, that's very good. But what? But, but nothing has changed in terms of fixing the big problems 
And and the big problems is, 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 is as you mentioned, is that the pharmaceutical companies own the data. Uh, no one can, can get a hold of the data to reanalyze the data to then produce the critically appraised uh, randomized clinical trials at, at, the, at the top of the hierarchy of the revised yeah. uh, evidence-based medicine hierarchy. Yeah. You know, uh, at the very end of my book, you'll see that there are letters in an appendix that we wrote to the CEOs of the companies, uh, basically asking them, to release the data to us so that we could reanalyze it or to um, please beg them, tell us where we have gone wrong. Here is the paper that we have written. Show us where we have gone wrong. Uh, and if you can't show us where we've gone wrong, then please, doctor, take your name off of that paper and, and ask the, uh, the, the editor of the journal to retract that study. And those studies have not been retracted. Uh, it, it's what I call space junk. It's like space junk floating up there around, you know, above the earth. You can't get rid of it. These corrupted medical journal articles are cited over and over in prescribing guidelines uh, and in meta-analyses and in uh, systematic reviews. Still is positive. Can you tell us which those two studies are? Well, we were looking at... Um, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, mm -hmm. antidepressants for children and adolescents. And so the two studies were most famously GlaxoSmithKline study 329 and Forrest Laboratories study CITMD18. Uh, and the reason why we looked at those two studies is because they were both extremely influential and prescribing habits of physicians. Both of them um, accounted for enormous upticks in prescriptions for children and adolescents. Uh, and that was off-label. It, it is, you know, as a physician, it's legal for you to prescribe a drug off-label, but it is illegal for the pharmaceutical companies to promote off-label. And that's where they got caught. Both of them got caught. Um, we litigated those cases on behalf of our clients, but also the government got involved, the Department of Justice. And in the case of GlaxoSmithKline, the fine was $3 billion, which was the largest fine in uh, history at the time. Uh, Forest Laboratories also got caught promoting citalopram off-label. And they uh, paid millions, I can't remember just exactly, you know, hundreds of millions for uh, their fraudulent behavior. Uh, but the way I see it is this is just a slap on the wrist, that, that this didn't change anything. And if they make two or $3 billion a year pr promoting the drug off-label, it's still worth their while. This conversation that we're having now is a conversation that we physicians have in private usually, something along these lines, numerous, this, this is not an uncommon conversation in private, but it's very rare to come into the public, for a physician to come into the public sphere or to talk among patients with this, because where we end up, where I would end up as a physician is, I don't know what study to trust at that point, right? And and my expertise and, and my sense of being an intelligent person, an expert who cares, has been molded around this idea of evidence-based medicine. So it's, it's a threat to my identity as a physician, you know, and, and that's, frankly, that's where it really, that's one of the major problems is in that limitation of communicating, communicating publicly around it. So two things I want to say about that. One is that it, it feels as though we are anti-science to have such a conversation publicly, number one. And we have to change that because you stated very clearly that this is, a, this is pro-science. This is about raising the standard for evidence-based medicine and helping our patients better. Uh, number two, given we are where we are, I'm, I'm going to ask you later about how we solve this, but given we are where we are, is there a way that we can use the evidence that exists as best as possible, because it feels yep. to me like 
I've got a blindfold on at this point. Yeah. Well, I, I find that very interesting that you consider this a threat to your identity, you know, as a physician. Um, and and how do you, what's the take home message here? What are you meant to do with this information? Yeah. Well, well, I've, I've, I myself have, have uh, given lectures at medical schools and I have shadowed doctors during the day on their routine uh, to show me just exactly how evidence-based medicine works in practice. You know, and I was deeply impressed uh, of how that the whole concept changed the, the the practice of medicine, you know, and how you, you, you know, if you're, here's your, 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 your day, exhausting day dealing with patients and trying to sort of, um, you know, practice medicine with the best available evidence. And then, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, you all to get together for journal club. And, you know, when you talk about uh, the latest, the latest piece that's published in the, in the medical journals, you know, and I was pleased to see, you know, at the journal club, uh, the, the doctor's, uh, responding with a with a good deal of skepticism about these articles, you know. Well, let's let's start to look at this. I don't know. Well, let's go to the end of it and see what does it say. You know, Doctor So and So's received um, the money from GlaxoSmithKline or from Merck or whatever. And oh, let's see. You know, what does it say anything about where this manuscript came from and things? They were they were aware of the, yeah. of the key points. I don't, and I was impressed about that. That was great. Um, but but at, at the end of the day, you've got to do something. You've got yeah. to prescribe a medication. You've got yeah. to deal with these patients, and yeah. and so there you're left with um, a, 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 like what I called the crisis of credibility is the subtitle yeah. of my book here. Where do you go to find reliable evidence? And, and you know, it's, it's astounding to me that when you when you if you turn to the clinical uh, guidelines, the prescribing guidelines, uh, and you go through them one by one. You say, "Well, where did those come from?" Like well, they came from the same place. Yeah. Um, so, how, you know, how do you deal with this? I've actually found physicians that said that I had to stand down when I realized what was going on here. Yeah, I mean, that what you described in Journal Club that we look at the data and we say, well, who funded this? And, you know, speakers fees and all that, that's standard part of training. I remember that in residency, like all day, that was, that was a, a big part of it, which is good. What concerns me is there is so much that we cannot see that's not declared, right? I mean, the data that's not there is just not there. And it's also not mentioned. Yeah. So and, what is that called? It's called the, um, the file drawer phenomenon. Okay. That all of this negative data is just filed away and it never comes to light. Yeah. All right. That's a good phrase. I like that. The file drawer phenomenon. So that, that's what I mean. So, you know, we can say, and I think all physicians would say that we're aware of the bias, we're aware of um, corrupted trials and things like that. Um, but I'm not so sure. I mean, it's almost like you're walking and you don't know where the landmine is. Because you don't know what is the bad, the one that looks really good in the New England Journal of Medicine could be the one that was missing that data, right? And, yeah. you know, what all the major editors in NEJM, in Lancet, they've all spoken about this. I've seen articles from them. I've seen quotes from them. And it kind of makes a blip and a lot of people talk about it for a month or two and then it just disappears and nobody's yeah. talking about it anymore. Yeah. So it, I guess there's no there's no real solution to that except going to the root of the problem, right? There's there's no yeah. way to decide what's what what is the really reliable stuff unless I am conducting my own trial with my colleagues and I can we can trust ourselves to produce yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's a, it's a it's a deep problem when you think about um, you, you know what can I rely on upon and what can I not rely upon here. I'm not saying that all of the data from the clinical trials is corrupted. I'm not saying that you can't trust medical journals at all. Um, obviously, so some of the information is reliable and very important. Here's the problem. These people are professionals. They know how to disguise the fraudulent to make it look exactly like that which is real science. And that's the trouble, distinguishing between those two. That's where, you know, I had my 
epiphany at the law firm, just sitting there reading thousands and thousands and thousands of these confidential industry documents uh, and, and realizing just exactly what, what the influence of the marketing department is on the way in which science is presented. Uh, it's, it's sophistry at its finest in the 20th century. Can you, being a bioethicist, I would think that you've seen this before, this pattern before, you know, or this kind of behavior before. Can you give us some examples of, of this same kind of phenomenon where, you know, what you see is not what you get um, in other industries? Is this, is this a, a well-known, is the well-honed trade? Is this a well-known phenomenon in other industries? Well, that, that's a very interesting question because I started to wonder, um, I mean, first of all, is this just a problem in medicine? Um, and my God, you know, you've got these um, academics at um, academic medical centers who are responsible for corrupting their own discipline, who are participating in this um, knowingly. I, I thought, you know, if you think of other disciplines like physics and biology and chemistry, uh, does anything like this exist in these other fields of inquiry? I mean, my subject is philosophy. I can tell you that there is nothing, absolutely nothing like this that goes on in philosophy. Well, you could say, okay, because there isn't a lot of money there, is there? <laughs> but yeah. in medicine, uh, you know, it's prime for for corruption. And this is, by the way, I should say that this is this is really not new. Uh, I've seen evidence that back in 1907, that the editor of JAMA was was concerned about pharmaceutical companies. Um, corrupting the medical textbooks and the medical journals. So, you know, the, this problem of so snake oil salesmen behind the scenes has been a while around for a long time. I, I think, though, that what we are seeing now is something quite different, and that is the power of 21st century marketing, the power of the internet, of the television, of all of that media um, that's delivering the messages and, 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 you know, the wizard behind the screen that's controlling uh, the, the whole thing. That's new. And the other thing that's new is the mass production of medical journal articles through these medical communication companies. There is good evidence that back in the 1950s and 1960s, that such and such a medical journal article that promoted a drug by in the name of Dr. So-and-so turned out really to be a marketing executive for that company that wrote that manuscript and published it. But now what we see today is these things churned out by these like factory operations in the hundreds and, you know, colluding the medical literature. Is there any country that has laws in place to prevent this kind of thing? Or is this pretty much worldwide, every country? Um, you know, I can, I can only speak from the limitations of my view here in the United States. And it's what I call ground zero of the corruption in the preface of my book. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've also seen that it, it exists in Great Britain, uh, um, you know, and, you, and you'll see um, um, India complaining a great deal about uh, the corruption of the pharmaceutical industry in, 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 in their countries. I've seen also lots of evidence that, though, that uh, India is used uh, is, is a ground to use human beings as guinea pigs and uh, um, explo exploitation is much greater. Uh, in, in India, but, uh, you know, I, I do think it's a global phenomenon. So let's get to the solution. What is the solution here when, um, I can imagine what you might say, because if we're saying the ownership of the data is what the problem is, and if the responsibility for testing lies with industry, then I can imagine what the solution is, but what do you suggest in your book? Well, in the book, that Dr. Gerardini and I published, we endorse an idea that's already been proposed by 
uh, other academics. One was uh, Marsha Angel, who was the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and Sheldon Krimsky was a philosophy professor at Tufts University. They had both independently proposed this idea of um, uh, it, clinical trials being taken out of the hands of the pharmaceutical industry and put into the hands of an independent uh, body that would that would conduct these trials, would design them, conduct them, and and report them, uh, and the pharmaceutical industry would pay, let's say, a user fee or a tax. Uh, here's here's the molecule that they have ha have developed, uh, and and now it's going to be tested. So somebody else has got to do the testing. So that's that just seems plain common sense. Uh, and and I think that if something like this would were to be adopted and and you know, all research would be done uh, clinical research would be done at universities independent of pharmaceutical industry money, or it would be done by you know government government agencies, uh, that would at least sort of c clear up. Uh, a lot of the problem here with what what can be trusted and what cannot be trusted. I mean, there would still be, you know, the possibility of fraud and corruption, manufacturing data, people attempting to advance on the basis of their, you know, career aspirations and and um, fabricating data. There's still things like that to watch out for. But I think, you know, most of the corruption would disappear with that one suggestion. Just by saying that the study should not be conducted by the pharmaceutical company itself, but an external entity, either government entity or academic entity that is not receiving funding. It's the proverbial fox watching the hen house otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So, well, and, and so let me just expand on yeah. that point. Uh, is a, um, a friend of mine called Peter Doshi at the university of Maryland who um, created an initiative for the British Medical Journal called the RIAT, the Restoring um, Abandoned and um, the Clinical Trials. Uh, and this was one of the most promising developments I've ever seen to address the problem, that, that now you've got a, an independent body of researchers who, when they suspect that a clinical trial is corrupted, they approach the pharmaceutical company. They request to have the access to the data. Uh, they get independent funding to do a reanalysis of the data, and and this is this has been done uh, several times. Once under duress, GlaxoSmithKline was actually forced to give the RIAT team the data as a result of uh, of, of settlement negotiations in litigation. Uh, and that was the most successful one, and that was study 329. Uh, but but Peter Doshi and his colleagues have run up against the same problem that we have, that these companies claim on their websites to share the data with qualified, competent researchers. So you contact them and you say, OK, put your money where your mouth is. Here it says right on your website that you will share the data and you do not get a response from them. Hmm. What I have seen internally from their own internal documents is they get a hold of an email like that and they send it up the chain. Uh, and, and what they do is they, they denounce these um, people as heretics or as anti-vaxxers or something like that. Uh, and, and they, they, you know, they try the best they can to discredit the people who want to do the independent evaluations. Have you experienced that, you and Dr. Giardini, since publishing this book? We have. Uh, we have in the sense that we have written very polite requests uh, uh, to uh, have access to the data, uh, and um, we never get a reply. stories shared here are the experiences of the speakers. They're not intended as medical advice. Join our network or simply share your story at healthrevolution.org. Healing is possible.